Selamat pagi, good morning ya Tuhan uh, Ego 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 Hai uh, Today I want to uh, Before starting the class I want to introduce you uh, There is some uh, Guest here uh, From Nagoya Institute of Technology uh, Professor uh, Atsushi Sato uh, from Nagoya Institute of Technology and uh, he is an associate professor in a civil engineering branch. And uh, there is some uh, other guests and uh, you uh, that uh, from uh, Kakefu Chikeng and I want to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Tetsushi Oribe. Mr. Ono, please. Mr. Hidasi Watanabe, selamat pagi. Good morning. Thank you all. Mr. Akihiro Suike Suekuni, selamat pagi. And uh, there is uh, Mr. Hironobu Amaya from PT Kakefu Baja Industri Indonesia. Bisa bahasa Indonesia sangat pintar sekali Sudah 12 tahun di Indonesia Indonesia mau terang Oke Oke Before uh, starting this class I want to introduce Mr. Santo That uh, one uh, Will Present the lecture us today uh, Mr. Santo Asusi Dr. Eng uh, He is from Nakuya Institute of Technology and graduate uh, from uh, Nakuya Institute of Technology in uh, divisions of engineering, doctor course and completed in uh, 2000. And uh, there is a lot of papers that uh, Dr. Sato already uh, published. It's all about uh, civil engineering. But uh, today we want to introduce uh, about how to design building structures under ses uh, seismic load effect. And if you want to uh, have some, uh, there is a question in, in, in the end of uh, this class, and maybe that uh, Pak Maskor already said uh, before, it's about the, there is a uh, Gift from uh, Kakefu. So I don't know. Even uh, maybe Pa Aswins or Pa Pascoro will uh, give to you uh, by lottery. Or if there is uh, some uh, good questions, so maybe you you will give, you you will get the gift from Kakefu. But then let us let us let us we will decide about that. Okay, uh, Dr. Sato, this is then is yours. So uh, maybe if you want to introduce uh, the details, so you can take it to this Thank you very much. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Saya nama Atsushi Sato. Yes, uh, my name is Atsushi Sato, and I'm from Nagoya of Technology, as introduced by a professor, better professor. And today I would like to talk about uh, how to design building structure on a very seismic load effect. As you know, also Japan is one of the country where the very active in seismic. So the dominant load to design the building is always the seismic load. So I would like to give uh, information about how we are designing the buildings under seismic load and also not fully uh, fully informed but I would like to refer some values or code which is written in ASCE which is American standard and also the Europe uh, Euro code 8 which is the European standard. So basically American standard or Euro European standard are used in this uh, Asian region so I would like to make add some information about the related codes. 
Okay, uh, moving, before moving into the topic, I would like to give a brief information about uh, my city and Nagoya Institute of Technology. So this is giving you the global view of the locations. So at the top part, I'm showing the Japan and the integrators, you, your country is located there. So it's about 6,000 kilometers apart from both countries. And uh, <clears throat> the city of Nagoya, have you ever heard or have you been to Nagoya? Nobody. So let's give a brief information. Where is Nagoya is located in Japan? So Japan Island looks like this uh, small island. And if you see the main part, in the east side, we have Tokyo. And almost in the middle, the most famous ancient city, Kyoto, and Osaka is located. And very close to Tokyo, we have Yokohama. So in between this uh, Tokyo and Osaka, this place is a uh, uh, we, we have Nagoya City, and uh, it's in Aichi Prefecture. And if you go this part, this part is the most famous city, Toyota. Headquarters of Toyota is located around this place. So basically, uh, this region is having a very heavy industrial area. So like a lot of motor companies. Toyota, Honda, Mitsubishi, headquarters are located in And if we go uh, focus uh, on the center of Nagoya, this is Nagoya city, and almost in the center of the city, we have our campus. And if you get more closer, uh, this is the main station called Nagoya Stations, and you just take the station by two stops, you can reach to our campus. So it is located in a very convenient place. So we have a lot of students coming from suburbs by taking bus or train by one and a half hours. But this is a very convenient place. So we have a lot of students coming from a different prefectures. So this is the information about the Nagoya city. And talking about myself, uh, I'm, my department is Department of Architecture, Civil Engineering, and Industrial Management Engineering. It's a little bit long department. And uh, my profession is uh, structural engineering, especially dealing on seismic design. And also I'm an art, art, a professional architect, so I got the license of the first class in, in Japan. And about my background, I'm now positioned to be associate professor in NI Tech, Nagoya Institute of Technology, but before moving to this position, I moved to several universities. So for example, I did a visiting scholar at the University of California, San Diego, and after spending two years in the US, I moved to Kyoto University as assistant professor for two years. And after that, I moved back to my home mother university in 2010, and I'm correct now doing associate professor in the end. And during, this, uh, during my stay in the I, I had a chance to be a visiting professor in uh, Czech Technical University in Prague. So it was like two years ago. So I did it at several universities in the world. And a little bit talking about my department. Basically, my department, as I mentioned, is having a long name. And it can be divided in three groups. So architecture and design, civil and environmental engineering, and system management and engineering. And basically, this department is merged to one department, but uh, mainly this is not mixed. So when you, the students are belong to architecture and, de and design, they will focus on architecture or design. And if they go to civil engineering, they will focus on civil engineering. And the definition of civil engineering in Japan is if you would like to deal about the building structure, for example, this campus or your home or some commercial buildings, it will be handled by the Department of Architecture. But once if you go to like a road, bridge, or the dams, which is strongly related to the infrastructures, in Japan, it is belonging to civil engineering. So we have a significant difference. But probably in your country, if you say civil engineering or structure engineering, that department will be handled the structure part. And architecture will mean basically the design. So I think we have a very significant difference. So I think I would like to mention this first. Okay. And uh, this one is 
giving you some picture of uh, the lab I'm using in my campus, and we call this uh, structure lab. So we have this kind of uh, space for doing conducting the testings. And about the strong floor, we will first build some kind of like a framings for the reactions, and we do this kind of testing. This picture is showing the test of the beam to column connections test. So the vertical component is a column, and the horizontal component is a piece. And this region we call the joints. And we sometimes do this kind of testing in the lab. And also, not only the steel structures, but basically the timber, the traditional uh, houses in Japan is made by timber or wood. So also we do some timber structure testings in the lab and improve the structure performance, especially for the size of And this one is showing the picture of my group. This is myself, and this is the team of my research group. Currently, I have, uh, how many students now? Like eight or nine. And sometimes I also have some international students from abroad. And his name is Vincent. At this moment, he was coming from France and doing research. Okay, so this is some of the introduction before we start to the main topic of my presentation. Okay, so let's move into the topic of today's uh, seminar. The seismic design procedure, and I especially focus on steel structures. This is giving you the statistical data of the uh, risk rate for seismic motions, and this one is showing the distribution of uh, ecocenters in the all over the world, and this data is between 2004 to 2013, and which the magnitude is uh, greater than five is plotted in this map. As, as I showed you in the first uh, slides, Japan is located here, and Indonesia is located here. So I can, as you can recognize, that Japan is one of the famous countries which very have a lot of earthquakes, but also you, you can understand that and below the Java and Sumatra Island, there is a Java Trench. So it means there is also a very large number of earthquakes. Of course, so one, month, one month ago we had earthquakes in this region, and a lot of damage was happened. So also, I believe that in Indonesia, it is very important to do the science design for the buildings, especially also for the residential buildings, because uh, such kind of number of the residential houses is having a significant amount compared to the commercial. So in my understanding, first, the important thing for the engineers is how to, uh, how to design the residential houses in the engineering countries. It's very important. And this is also giving the number of earthquakes which happened in the world, almost uh, the data of 10 years. And if in, the, in between these years, we had almost 1,600 1, earthquakes, which have the magnitude is greater than six. And almost 20% of the earthquakes happened. And probably Indonesia is also having a very large majority, according to the map. And this one is giving you the number of the deaths and missing persons, <laughs> the event which happened in Japan. And this one is giving you the data between the past 20 years. And as you can recognize here, almost 90% of the dead and killed uh, people during the disaster is caused by the earthquake or the tsunami. So it means that that is a reason why always uh, designing the buildings should be considered under the earthquake. So that's the main reason. And uh, intuitively, probably, uh, you have an image that uh, probably some of the some of the students in this class have an image that Japan is a very significant kind of earthquake. So there must be a long history in seismic design. So I would like to give you a brief uh, history tables of how the code is developed in Japan. And in that, so if you go back to the history, the blue color is showing the disaster, and the red color is showing about upgrade information. So in 1923, we had a very significant uh, earthquake, Great Kanto earthquake, with the magnitude is close to 8. And during 
this earthquake, the death or missing people reached to like 105,000 people were killed. And mainly the, the killed people were due to the fire. So after this uh, disaster, the city of Tokyo decided to do some upgrade. And mainly they put an additional regulations for the fires, but also in 1924, they wrote the requirements for the seismic design. And this was a year for the designer, for the man that they have to take care of the seismic loads in the design. So it means before 1924, we didn't have any rules how to design for the seismic events. And after several years, in 1948, Fukui earthquake occurred in the middle part of Japan, and that magnitude was magnitude 7.1. And in this, during this disaster, almost 300, 3,800 people were killed. And uh, in this term, from this, in this term, not only the timber structures, but gradually in Japan, we started to build the rainforest concrete structures. So after this event, the government Japan decided to build a lot. And in, after two years, we had a building standard of law. And this is a law, not a standard. So if you violate the law, it will be, it will be a criminal. So basically, the government decided to make a law, and this law should be applied all over the country. In 2004, they had some rules, but this was only applied on the capital city of Berlin. But the Fukui is like a more suburb prefecture. So after this event, the government decided to build, to compile the law. And so it means when you go back to see the history, the seismic design procedure was compiled in 1950. So it means our history of seismic design is only having like 70 years. So it's relatively new. And after several events like in 1968 or 1978. Finally, in 1981, the building standard law had a significant upgrade based on the, the damage or damage observed in the past earthquakes. And the building standard law provided the equivalent of last procedure. And this is the basic design procedure still we're using in the practice. So this 1981 is one of the key years for our country, and we are still using this design procedure. So mainly, I would like to focus about the design procedure which was compiled in 1981. And of course, after the 1981, we had a lot of earthquakes. In 1995, we had the great Hanshin Awaji earthquakes and almost 6,400 uh, people were killed during this earthquake. But, uh, yes, so killed. So after this earthquake, we had some upgrade in the seismic design procedure, but we didn't change the design procedure which was compiled in 1981, because almost all the damage which was observed in 1995 event was a structure which was constructed before 1981. So old buildings, which was not following the existing procedure, had a collapse. But the structure, which was based on the existing 1981 design procedure, didn't have a collapse. Of course, there was a minor damage, but it didn't go to the collapse mode. So it, the, that event proved that the existing standard was su sufficient to protect the human life. So we still use, that's the reason why we're still using the design procedure, which was compiled in 1981. But from the economic point of view, even if it is a small damage to the building, when we think about the service ability or reusability, we have to terminate the usage of the building during the, repair, during the repairs. But from the point of economic view, if you close the office for two weeks, the company will have a significant loss. So it means 
such kind of idea uh, happened after these years. So after this event, the government finally decided to add another design procedure. In 2000, they added the additional event procedure called the calculation method of response and limited strength. And in 2005, they added another design procedure, energy balance based seismic resistance design procedure. And basically, this design procedure is called performance based design. So the, the structure designer will first determine what is the required performance in the structure. So, and based on that assumption, they will determine the structure members. So it means more freedom are given to the structure engineers. But freedom means you have to take, you must take the responsibility of design. But this kind of was lunch in the piece of the design procedure. So this is a situation in our country. And uh, this one, this slide is giving you about uh, when you try to conduct the design, firstly, as I mentioned, building standard of law. So Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transportation and Tourism is handling this law. And under this law, we have some notifications. And this one is a law. And the Architectural Institute of Japan, which is a professional, committee, uh, professional agency, is also compiling the latest research results to some recommendations. But uh, if we see the hierarchy, as I mentioned, building standard of law is a law. So, all designers cannot violate this part because this is a mandate. And notification is having a similar similarity. And uh, even if you don't get enough information from these two, like a law or notifications, the recommendation, which is published from the professional society, will be used. So this is a little bit unique part. Probably if you go to the and the case of the, the practice in the US, probably the US doesn't have the law. Almost all the recommendation which is, pub, which is compiled or published from the steel society or concrete society will be the design guide to be used. But the situation in Japan is a little bit different. <coughs> Firstly, we have to always follow them. And sometimes this is a headache for the because the uh, law is not easy to upgrade. Once if you write, it is really burden for the engineers because if you try to up rewrite the law, there is a lot of procedure to be to take, to be approved. So sometimes there is some old descriptions, but even if it is old, they have to follow the law. Sometimes so this kind of issue is always happening and the engineers are really complaining. And this is giving you some of the uh, some of the cover book of the uh, uh, recommendation, which is published from the professional agency, the Society of AIJ. Allowable stress design, plastic design, low resistance factor design concept are existing, and also we have some recommendation how to deal about the joints and how to deal about the stability of the structures. <coughs> In my understanding, the building standard of law is a law. So basically, they are giving you the concept of design, how it should be designed, and also what is the load, ac load actions and the resistance. But as, a, as I wrote here, if the designer tried to conduct, firstly, they will go through this building standard of law. But if needed information are not provided in this law or notification, it is a mandatory. Practice and I will use or to use a recommendation which is published by the AIJ. So this is the structure. Okay. I will skip this. So as I mentioned, I would like to give the information about the building standard of law. So this is giving the concept of design and also giving the information of the law which is used in the design. We have a several hierarchies or procedures. Firstly, if you try to build a structure which is greater than 60 meters, 
nonlinear dynamic response time mixture analysis should be conducted. So we don't have a static design procedure. All buildings, like the skyscrapers, should be designed based on time mixture analysis. And uh, the designer should get an endorsement of our certificate from the scientific committee. So we all structures, which is having a very tall building, should have a peer review. So it means it will be a really cost, they have to spend a lot of cost, and they have to go through a very strict uh, review from the professionals, like the professors of the structure engineers, engineering. But once, if the building is equal or less than 60 meters, so like 60 meters of the rainforest concrete is like 25 stories or like 30 stories, this kind of buildings are allowed to use the standard procedure. The standard procedures I'm mentioning here is a procedure which is compiled in 1981. And we call this one the equivalent lab love force procedures. So it means we can apply only the static analysis, not dynamic analysis required for this kind of buildings. And as I mentioned, the validity was proved through Kobe earthquake, which happened in 1995, and Tohoku earthquake, which occurred in 1911. Okay. By the way, uh, I will provide this whole slides after this lecture, so probably uh, somebody's are taking some pictures. So if you're really interested, I will up, I will provide this uh, slide to your, to your professor, so you can download uh, somewhere from the website. So don't worry. Um, if you miss some words from my slides. Sorry about that, I have to mention that first. So we have, I would like to talk about this. And as I explained, we have the first design procedure, which is called by 1981. But also, I mentioned, as I mentioned, we have two another procedures, uh, which is called performance-based design. But maybe 90% of the structures are computed by this design procedure, so I will focus on this basic design procedure which is used in the real practice. Equivalent love force procedure. This procedure is also uh, provided in the ASC 7 and also in your code. So similar procedure existing in all over the world. But the difference is uh, we have several design paths. We call it root. And root 3, root 2, and root and designer can select uh, whichever he wants, but uh, I we can say root through is the most sophisticated design procedure, and root one is a simplified design procedure based on root three. So the simplified means there is a lot of limitations. So if you try to design root one by steel structure, they are only limiting for two stories. For rainforest concrete, probably it's also two stories. This there is a lot of limitations. So if the building, so this kind of route is existing, and the most sophisticated one is requested to the buildings, which is the building higher than 31, but less than 60 meters. So almost like uh, 15 or 10 stories maybe reach the 31 meters. So greater than 10 story or less than 20 story will be this, should be followed this root 3 design procedure. And if we see in detail, the procedure is with requesting two design phases. Allowable stress design and ultimate strength design. And the allowable stress design is uh, the requirement for the service limit state and the damage limit state. And in the second phase, is uh, ultimate limit state, so no collapse requirements is applied for the second phase. So we have, the designer should pass two phases. And uh, according to my understanding, probably Europe or the ASC design procedure is only having this requirement. And uh, not fully following the allowable stress design. So they are only checking the ultimate strength design, and there is some limitation in the storage or some service limit space, but they are not requesting to do the 
page one. So this is a unique part in our design procedure. Personally, I would like to give about the rough, the rough concept of the phase one, I call it allowable stress design, and it is fairly easy to explain in the equations. So the right side of the equation is giving the allowable stress, and this is stipulated in the building standard of law. So if you select the material, for example, if you select steel or concrete, the value are given in the building standard of law. And the right, left side of the equation is the design stress. So if you model the structure and you apply the, the load, means mechanical, <coughs> if you do the, just a simple calculation based on elastic, you can know what is the force subjected to the members. So based on that force, you will know what is the stress existing in the members. So comparing the allowable stress and if you fulfill this equation, it means a lot of stress design is fulfilled. So you can have, you can move to the phase. And uh, in the seismic event, also we have to think about the service limit state and damage limit state under the uh, seismic moderate earthquake. So the, if you see, if you, if you use the return period of the term, 50 years return period is used for the moderate earthquake. And if you say the probability exceedance, it's about 20% 20 20 exceedance probability in 10 years. So this kind of uh, seismic intensity is considered in the service limit state. And this is giving you the design table, which is uh, stipulated in the building standard of law. So long term related to the service limit state. So in this phase, we all don't have to care about the seismic design. But the short terms, it means we have to think about a little bit of accidental loads, like strong wind, which is coming from the typhoon, for example, and earthquakes. And based on the short term, we have to think about the load combination, including the seismic loads. And based on this, we will apply the load to the structure. And also, in the root three, in Phase one, there is a limitation of the storage. It means even if the allowable stress is fulfilled, if the storage is significant, it means the service limit state, or uh, if it's not comfortable, if it is really flexible. For example, if you have a really flexible floor, and if you walk in the floor, you will feel some vibration. Probably no client will expect to have like um, such kind of uncomfortable. Design. So to, to avoid such kind of situations, also in our code, we in our law, there is a requirement for the, the storage. And in the phase one elastic design, the storage drift should be less than one over 200. So it seems relatively strict, but if you go and see the Euro code, they are also giving with the same numbers, 0.5%. Of the storage bit is a limitation, one of the limitations. And if you go to the AS7, as I mentioned, basically the AS7 is focusing on ultimate limit state design. So if they are not giving you the limitation on the elastic limit, but in the ultimate limit state design, they are also giving you the storage bit limitation. And based on their the AS7 manuals, for example, if it is a very resisting frame, they are giving you like 2.5% or 2% of the limit. But there is some limitation in the story. So some similarity can be found in also the other uh, design procedures. Okay, so first, uh, this is the requirement for the allowable stress design. So allowable stress and the story is requested. And the ultimate stress design, which is called for phase two, is uh, to prevent the collapse of the structures. So first requirement is structure safety should be confirmed. So it means that it has to be proved that the structure will never collapse. Of course, there is allowed to have some damage. And in this phase, the return period of the seismic event is about 500 years. Phase one, as I mentioned, is 50 years. In this, in this phase, it is 500 years. But in the probability, 
we say 10% exceedance probably the entire 50 years. So this is kind of difference we can call. And the requirement from the phase two should be fulfilled this question. The right size is giving you the capacity of the buildings, and the left side is giving you the required carrying capacity of the building. And this one is given by the building standard. And a little bit, this is giving a lot of equations or formula how to compute what is a required. And to compute the required, there are three values which, you, which is used for the required, compute the required strength. The right side, Q sub UDI, is the load action determined by the linear response spectrum. So if you have the spectrum, you will know what is the maximum. So based on that elastic response, you will know what is the Q sub D. And uh, based on the ductility, I will talk later about the ductility of the ductility reduction factors, there is some coefficient multiplied with the elastic response. And in between, I write the shape factor is giving you the coefficient, like a penalty. So basically, it, the meaning of S sub E is equal to 1 is having a regular building in plan in elevations. But of course, you are a student in architecture. So probably, you will never design a building with the same floor plan in the same elevation. That means you must have some penalties because there is some eccentricities in the planning. But that kind of idea is added in this form. And uh, this kind of philosophy, strong column weak in philosophy, is requested. The meaning of strong column weak, uh, weak in philosophy is the structure fuse. Fuse means the, the component which dissipates the earthquake energy should be located in the beam and must be avoided from the columns. Because if you have a, a hinge in the columns, it means it will trigger to have a story collapse, soft story collapse. So um, story, soft story collapse means a very dangerous collapse. Mode. And so that's why it should be avoided. So that's the reason why we have the beam, strong column we be in And again, if you go in detail of the other design procedures, for example, in Europe or 8, there are also a similar re requirement. The strength of the column should be greater than the strength of the B. And the coefficient 1.3 is like a safety factor is applied. And also you can see in Japan we use 1. So a little bit Japan is more strict than Europe, but similar concept is used. And also in SC7, I uh, no, it's not SC7, AISC, it's uh, American Iron Steel Construction, is providing 3418, which is a seismic provision. And in their chapter of moment resisting frames, there are uh, requirements for the strong column B in philosophy. And uh, in these equations, the numerator is giving you the strength of the column, and the denominator is giving the strength of the beams. I will try. Uh, I will skip the detail of these equations, but uh, it means this equation should be greater than 1.0 means column should be stronger than the beam. But uh, if you do the calculation in detail, the meaning is like in having some coefficient. It's a similar thing. But also in US, they have this kind of uh, philosophies. Okay. <coughs> So this one is the uh, elastic response, and uh, we will uh, multiply the coefficient, seismic story share coefficient, at each story. So it means the uppercase W sub I means the total weight of the, of the structures. So if you're designing three-story buildings, and if you're focusing on two stories, means two stories is supporting the weight from the third story and the second story. And the lateral force is a ratio of the weight. This kind of idea is used. And when you try to compute this coefficient, we have also several coefficients. But roughly, I would like to give the information what kind of coefficient this one is. And that is the region factors. Probably, uh, if you have a chance to see the, the spectrum map, 
to your inclinations. Corresponding to the locations, high seismicity, low seismicity, there is some acceleration given in the different locations. So the location is given in this part. So if there is less activity in seismic, this coefficient is giving a small value. And R sub E is elastic response factor. So if you select the site, the, the code, the standard in Indonesia is also giving you what is the design response spectrum corresponding to the site. So similar, if we have it here. And A sub I is the lateral force procedure. So the distribution of the <coughs> structures. And uh, C sub zero is the intensity. Anyway, this kind of coefficient is given. But if you see in detail for other standards, for example, in your code A, the not independent, not uh, separately, but the combination of the location coefficient region and the response spectrum, there is a horizontal elastic response spectrum stipulated in your code 8. And the lateral distribution is also given in your code 8 in a different word about modal spectrum. So they have, you have to carefully see the, how the structure will rest. And let's see the, the American standard, which is more familiar in Indonesia. The seismic ground motion values, which is given in chapter 11 of ASC 7, this value is given as a response spectrum. And if you see chapter 12, uh, close 8.3, there is a formula how to compute the distribution in the elevations. Okay, and going to the coefficient of the penalty, if you see in detail, this is composed by two coefficients. Penalty <coughs> factor to consider irregularity in the elevations, and penalty factor to consider irregularity in the plan. So elevation and plan penalty is evaluated by this coefficient. And there is a maximum values. So if it is a regular building, there is no penalty. But if you have a lot of irregularity in elevation and plant, you have a penalty maximum to 3.0. 3.0 means if you have a regular building, and if you switch it to the regular buildings, the load which can which have to be used for the design must be increased to three times. So intuitively we can imagine that regular building is having a lot of penalty, but we, we have this kind of uh, penalty factors. And if you see the details of, from the Euro code 8, there is also some description about the irregularity, and also there is some description about the irregularity in the elevations. And you recall also in <coughs> AC7, there is some uh, description in chapter 12 of clause 3.2, irregularity, uh, irregular and regular classification. And the table giving you how, that what is the definition of the horizontal and the vertical irregularities. So AC7 is also giving the similar definitions. So you can recognize that basically, we, we, if you just focus on phase two design, your code 8 or your AAC 7 is having a similar design procedure. But of course, the value is a little bit different. But basically, we're having the same design concept. And I would like to give you what is the meaning of D sub S. And also, this idea is given in your code and AAC 7. And is phase 1 is elastic design. So if, we, if the seismic motion is stopped, it means the structure will go back to the original position. It means no residual stress or no damage in the structure. But in phase two means when the seismic intensity increased to 500 years, means the probability, when you think about the probability, the occurrence is relatively small. So in such kind of uh, accidental uh, loads, the concept of design procedure is given in these figures. Basically, if we have the elastic structures, and under the, under the seismic intensity 
which is a return period of 500, will be response in this elastic. This is uh, needed energy absorbed by the structures. But uh, from the point of economy, from the <coughs> economic point of view, keeping elastic <coughs> structure, which is having a return period of 500, will be not efficient because uh, probably our life, we can only live like in maximum 500, no, no, 100. 500 is over beyond our life length. So in that case, we say this is an accident. So if we will having such kind of a large intensity earthquake, the concept is, okay, let's allow some damage in the structure components and try to rely on the ductility <coughs> of the system. So the concept is, if we have the same area on the elastic response and this elastic plastic response, and if the area is the same, means area is equal to the energy. And earthquakes means the input of the energy should be absorbed somehow in the structures. It can be okay to absorb by the elastic response, or it can be absorbed by the elastic or plastic response. So the concept is why don't we use uh, the ductility part of the structure's component? So this is a concept of the design flow designed to the uh, ESAP-S coefficient. And uh, if we have sufficient ductility in the structures. For example, if we're using steel structures, intuitively we can imagine the steel having a large ductility compared to concrete. So if we have a large ductility, it means the V sub S, which can which have to be used to compute the yield load, can be a large value. Because if you have a sufficient ductility, ductility can take care of the energy, even if you have a low strength. So this kind of idea is used for this concept. And similarly, a different uh, character is used, but in your code A, they have the behavior factor Q, and they use Q equal to 4 or Q equal to 5. This means they divide the elastic response amount by 4 or 5 to compute what is the required yield strength in the system. And I think this figure is much easier for understand. So this one is the structure, actual structure response of one of the existing buildings. And if, according to the elastic response spectrum, we will know what is the expected base share under elastic response in the seismic intensity return per equal to 500. And in the design table, of the AC7 or in the standard of Indonesia, probably you're having the value R, omega, and C sub D. Have you ever heard of this seismic response coefficient? No, okay. I will talk a little bit. <laughs> okay, so this is actual. So it means, of course, we can, some of the designer can, as I mentioned, design based on this uh, this uh, share force, but uh, from the point of economic view, it is a little bit a burden for the client. So as I mentioned, we let, why don't we try and rely on this ductility? But depending on the ductility. So the concept is R is a value, how we can reduce the forces for the design. So in this case, R V sub E, which is coming from the elastic response, is divided by R to compute what is a design for seismic force. So this design force level will give you how to determine the member which should be used for the energy dissipations. But if the structure is indeterminate, there is some strength effect. So the ultimate, in the ultimate level, there is some hardening or uh, structure force redistribution. So in the ultimate state, the strength of the structure will reach this point. So to estimate what is the ultimate strength of the capacity of the structures, 
the code is giving you the omega to compute to bump up the required strength. So these kind of values are given in the standards. When I go through the standard in Indonesia, also these values are tabulated, depending on the systems. So if you're using, if you're trying to design a moment resisting frame, R is equal to like eight. If you go to the concrete, for example, R is like given like 6.5. Some kind of values are given. So it means, according to the elastic response, you will have this amount, V sub E, and based on the given R, depending on the structures, you will know what is the design process. So this kind of design procedures are used. But I, I would like to strongly mention that some of the engineers are taking that. This is like a bonus. Because if you have a large R, Design force are having a small value. But that understanding is only just focusing on the vertical axis. If you're taking small design value, it means you are relying on large deformations. So it means large deformation is having a significant damage somewhere. Like for example, maybe the structure component in the the component which is used for the Energy dissipation is only is always used to have a hinge or uh, damage in the beads. So it means if you're relying a large deformation deformability of the structures, means you're having a significant damage in the beads. So if you have a large strength redu reduction for the to determine the line forces, you also have to think, think about carefully about what is the lateral force, lateral displacement vertical horizontal axis. So if you have a small value, you're having you're suffering your structure to have a large damage. Because we're trying to rely on the energy dissipation coming from the from from coming from the deformability of the structures. So this part should be really carefully done. So if you have a less strength reduction for the design, but it means you're having a less damage in the structure. So it's like a trigger. But you have to really carefully understand what the meaning of it. So you cannot think that R is not a bonus. You have to think that it's also one kind of a penalty. And this is giving you the summary of the design values which is given in the different design standards or law. The first column is giving you the value of given in AC7. In the middle column is the building standard which is from Japan, and this is from Europe. And I'm focusing on the special moment resisting frame, which is defined as the most tactile structure system in steel. And R is a modification response coefficient. R equal to 8 is given in ASC7, and we never have the definition of R in the big standard model. But there is a definition called Three is omega naught, is over strength. So we can focus that when we try to make a direct comparison, this is the reason. This is the value we have to be carefully focused. In AC7, R sub mu is given to, based on this value, R sub mu, which is uh, used to compute the ultimate strength, is used 2.67. And building standard law is given four, and uh, European standard is given five. So you can see that there is a lot of difference. For example, if you compare with the AC7 and the European standard, almost two times difference. And uh, basically, this is an inverse value of the R sub mu, so we can see a significant difference. The smallest value which is used for design is European code. And the second one is the uh, building standard code, which is, which is coming from Japan. And the US is uh, having the largest value. So we always compare, some, some research compares this 8 and 4. So it means US is taking care of really low values for the seismic design. But if you really understand the, the behaviors or the definitions, as I mentioned, in these figures. We cannot directly compare these force levels. 
So it means that US is really more conservative to the Japanese standards. So we can find them. So if you are really interested what is the big difference, probably it is a good uh, motivation to understand the size of this. But concept is the same, but a little bit of the values are different. It's coming from this thing. Okay. I will skip this part a little bit. Uh, spend a lot of time. So. Okay. Uh, I would like to make a little bit of a question time. And I talked about the standard design procedure, which is stipulated in the standard for each Do you have any questions about my explanations? If I've mentioned, Tony will explain something. Please, please explain something. Okay, maybe in the next hour. Okay, that'd be good. We have to see more. That is not a movie we need. Tony has to escape it, you know. Tapi saya mencoba untuk apa namanya? There is someone from civil engineering here. No. Okay. Saya sedikit uh, memberikan satu gambaran bahwa di dalam apa namanya uh, seismic design untuk uh, apa yang tadi di, dikatakan bahwa ada perbandingan antara seismic design antara Jepang, uh, Eropa, sama Amerika itu yang perlu diperhatikan. Kenapa? Ke, kenapa mereka berbeda? Kemudian uh, yang penting adalah di nilai-nilainya. Tapi yang paling penting di sini. Uh, ada yang harus anda perhatikan yaitu tadi ada rumus antara lokasi kemudian site lokasi sama site itu ternyata berbeda lokasi itu bisa Yogyakarta tapi site nya itu juga sangat spesifik yang direpresentasikan dengan R1 tadi ya R sub uh, I gitu ya nah, kemudian uh, di situ ada shape factors jadi kalau kamu, anda memakai regular shape maka uh, tadi disebutkan anda tidak akan uh, kena uh, final pinnya. Tapi kalau anda memakai irregular shape atau bentuk-bentuk yang yang um, mungkin uh, secara standar di dalam di dalam uh, desain ini berhubungan dengan arsitektur sangat berhubungan dengan arsitektur maka uh, di situ ada perbedaan antara plan sama elevation. Nah, itu itulah yang yang membuat apa namanya bahwa antara bentuk dasar bentuk dena sama uh, bentuk ketinggian itu uh, sangat mempengaruhi di dalam uh, desain uh, karena seismik ya. nah itu faktornya seperti apa bidangnya seperti apa tadi uh, dijelaskan yang terakhir itu adalah masalah tentang uh, deformasi sama lateral force ya. jadi lateral force uh, dengan deformasi kalau misalkan di situ ada energi yang anda mendesain suatu bangunan yang uh, kuat uh, menahan apa namanya uh, deformasi, di mana tadi disebutkan uh, tadi uh, mengurangi energi ya. Jadi kalau ada uh, beban lateral, kemudian bangunan anda itu sangat kuat menahan menahan apa namanya uh, deformasi, maka yang harus diperhatikan itu adalah ductility atau uh, material. Ductility itu adalah material bagaimana uh, dia pecah pada uh, masa tertentu. Itu yang, yang yang perlu diperhatikan. Tapi kalau ah, di situ ada elastisitas, berarti dia menahan uh, gaya lateral, kemudian bangunan anda mempunyai gaya elastis, berarti di situ ada deformasinya. Ya. Maka bahan-bahan apa tadi yang disebutkan juga atau faktor-faktor apa yang yang harus diperhatikan. Nah, inilah uh, tadi. Ya, kaitannya ya jadi di situ ada shape kemudian ada lokasi kemudian ada site yang perlu diperhatikan kemudian ada deformasi nah, ini saya juga uh, baru tahu persis detailnya di sini karena pada waktu baca itu hanya angka keamanan saja kalau saya berbicara dengan orang sipil pokoknya untuk uh, Aceh angka keamanannya adalah 9 sekarang ya untuk uh, untuk Jawa Barat angka keamanannya 7 nah, itu aja itu hitungannya itu saya nggak tahu detailnya seperti apa ternyata sangat uh, detail sekali ya terhadap uh, deformasi plan elevation shape ya, regular atau irregular shape uh, kemudian ada lateral force tentunya itu karena uh, masalah uh, apa namanya masalah uh, seismik tadi ya. 
itu yang yang bisa ya mungkin uh, catatan catatan anda nanti akan bisa menjadi uh, last question tadi ya mungkin the best questions uh, will give will get the gift ya maybe ya oke mungkin ada pertanyaan tadi uh, pertanyaan itu tadi uh, sedikit saya simpulkan tapi aja pasti di angka-angka dan saya juga enggak tapi secara konseptual seperti itu ya beberapa sahaja. Tapi you you can continue. Okay. In the last. Atau boleh lihat anda. Okay, thank you. My name is Lily and I'm a lecturer here and my expertise in fire safety in architecture. I have a question about performance-based design. You mentioned that uh, in Japan, performance-based design is inter was inter introduced uh, about in about 2000, year 2000. Yes, it's, it's quite, quite quite new. Uh, I want to, uh, for your information, that in Indonesia, we have uh, not implement, implement uh, the performance-based design design in our structure, our standard, but in prior safety standard we have mentioned it in our standard, just mentioned, not implemented. Uh, okay, so my question is about the performance-based design. How far is the performance-based design of our standard, uh, performance-based design or performance-based standard in Japan in your DSL um, um, influence the architecture design in Japan because it's very it's quite strict about the shape about the uh, yeah material and so on so how far and uh, the, the the second question is uh, uh, are there are there um, uh, problems in uh, performance based implementation in a new country because in Indonesia uh, there are many, many, uh, many problems with implementation, such as uh, the, the expert. Uh, we have no, uh, not enough expert to do the simulation of analysis of performance-based analysis, something like that. How about, how about the thing in Japan? And the third question is, <laughs> it's many, I have many questions, I'm sorry. Uh, how is the, the role of the academic or the university in this, uh, or I mean that the relation of uh, the standard uh, implementation and uh, the course or yeah the education in, in Japan because you you, you come from uh, yeah yeah that's, that's I think so. thank you. Uh, I will try to explain. And uh, okay. example, which one? Which one? Okay. Uh, in two thousand and two thousand and five, as I mentioned, uh, the government finally decided to have a performance design procedure. And this one is the uh, procedure. The reason why the uh, much this kind of design procedure is if the designer will follow this design procedure, it means they never need they will never need a peer review. So that's one of the advantages. But I will talk in reality. When I talk with a lot of engineers, everybody will follow this because this procedure is can skip the peer review but as you mentioned there is a lot of restrictions and limitations and a lot of calculations are requested so maybe uh, I would like to talk at the end of this uh, seminar but for example this energy balance based design seismic design uh, based resistance design procedure is focusing on like uh, adding uh, energy devices like dumpers and the structures. So this one is the concept of 
when you install a new device in the structure and try to remain the main structure as elastic, this design procedure can be used. But if you try to apply this procedure, there's a lot of assumptions. So once the designer tried to use this procedure, design procedure, it is much easier for us to then not going this uh, procedures, but directly going to time history analysis and get the peer reviews. Because a lot of engineers already have a lot of experience to have the peer reviews. So if they try to apply this kind of new technique in the buildings, they will never use this. So in reality, as I mentioned, almost 90% or I can say almost 100% structures are using this procedure or it is more advanced buildings. They will directly go to the peer reviews and get the end straight from the side. Yes, I tried some calculations. It is really difficult or you have to prepare a lot of things. And mainly it is, uh, it is compiled to apply on the regular buildings, not the irregular buildings. So once if you go to the irregular buildings, there is a lot of penalties. So it's much better to go to time history analysis because such kind of penalty, that for example, eccentricity, would be included in the structure models. So if you're uh, including the eccentricity in the plan and operation, like in the space model of the, in the, the calculations, it's already including the effect of the eccentricity. And the, amount, the effect of the eccentricity is not significant as shown, which is considered considered by the coefficient coming from the eccentricity. So that's the reason why the designer will never follow this procedure and never go to the time history. That is the idea that I have And about the coursework about in the university, in the undergrad, the like bachelor course, basically we give the basic uh, basic knowledge, for example, what what is so elastic structure mechanics or in determinant or indeterminate structures. And if you go to the third grade, we will teach what is a classic analysis. So, so basic things, uh, which is already, most of them are included in the law, are, uh, are having a class. But if you go to the master course, a little bit we will teach like advanced. Sometimes this is written in the code, so we will give you an idea what is the meaning of the calculation as of the rest of the data strings or the energy balance, but they will really understand that this is a very complicated And also in the master course, there, were, there will be uh, next engineers, so we also teach them uh, the concept of the time history analysis, how to model or how to make the assumptions of the data. Not the sophisticated, not the very complicated problem, very easy examples. For example, three story steel structure buildings. And we'll give us such kind of uh, uh, homeworks for them, and they will uh, step by step do some calculation from build by following these procedures. But on the, on the other side, they will do some kind of history analysis and do some comparison. So, such kind of uh, classes are taking care of in the master. But uh, the works in the master course are not directly uh, make an influence to the standards or recommendations. It's more related to the research topic in, in, in each group. For example, in my, in my research group, I'm specialized in steel structures. So I have a student, as I mentioned, I have a student, nine students, and I will give a subject to, which is relating to the upgrade of the standard. On based on that result, that result will be make an influence to the recommendations. So such in such student, with the students which is such institutions will have a strong relationship, a uh, strong relation with the upgrade of the standards or upgrade of the recommendations, but not all the students in the course do not. So I'm especially dealing with steel, so I never know what's happening on concrete. But next to my group, I have a professor in concrete. In that research group, they are doing a lot of research how to upgrade in the recommendation in the rules in the rainforest project. So this kind of systems or structures are used in our, in our, in our universities. For most of the universities, well, we're following the same, same 
have some like uh, modern structure which is following which is uh, which had the idea from the Asian heritage temple and uh, in very close to Tokyo station we have a building uh, called the Mitsubishi buildings and that building's uh, structure concept is coming from the structure mechanism of the temples and it really worked so we're still learning learning from a lot of ideas from the heritage So we still have a uh, thirty minutes. Okay. Uh, I would like quickly go, and I would like to skip some of the parts. But thirty minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Next topic is about the design procedure uh, of B two column collections which is used in steels. And uh, I just arrived in Indonesia two days ago, and uh, I had a chance a little bit to look around uh, the buildings. And in my, in my understanding, probably very far from the majority of the like, uh, tall buildings, and it is not so often to see a full steel structure. But I would like to give, in Japan, we have a lot of like a tall building constructed by steel structure. And I would like to give uh, some information how it is constructed. And this is very unique. And uh, probably you, you, some questions were raised a lot. First, I would like to give you this first. Our country really loves the building. 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 Not building. Building. Sorry. Okay. So this one is giving you the typical mean to column connections. And for the column, we use SHS columns. This means the two columns. We never use H profile for the columns. This is one of the unique ones. And uh, we put some continuity plate in Japanese where we call diaphragm. Here, at the bottom. This is a beam. So to connect the beam to the columns, the flange should be welded to the columns, but if we directly weld the column, the flange to the columns, there is no stiffness because it is the plate, the flange is directly connected to the if it is connected to the flange of the columns, it means there is a flexibility. But uh, to have a cons uh, uniform transformation of the force, we install continuity plates at the top and the bottom of the map. And we weld this continuity plate to the columns. And after welding this continuity plate, we do the welding of the flange to the continuity plate. But just explaining why this figure is really difficult. So I just uh, put some pictures how we build these connections in the shop. So this is a computer graphics. And reality, uh, first, we will buy some square hollow section columns from the market. And uh, it is a lot. But first, try to make these panels to install the diaphragm. We chop this column first at the height of the B. And this is a continuity plate. And we will build this kind of we call panel zone first. And this is the reason why I said we love buildings. Because we do the full penetration to connect this diaphragm to the panel component of the panel zones. So it means we have we input a lot of energy to do the welding. Because it was originally not continuous columns, but the, to make this panel, to install this diaphragm, we cut it and we install this place. So first we have to do weldings. And after doing the weldings, we weld the beams to this panel zone. And also the welding on the flange should be full penetration. So we put a lot of effort to do the weldings. 
and this one that is complete joint penetrations. And after making this component, we will weld the columns. So this one is a panel with beam, and after this we put together the column with the upper floor panels on and the lower floor panels on. So this is a story columns, and this is the upper story or the lower story panels. And again, we will do the full penetration to have a constant or smooth full penetration. And uh, some professor from the overseas says it looks like a Christmas tree. So they say it's like a tree structure. And this is very unique. And we never see this kind of a uh, component in the, all over the sea. But we do welding in the com com complete joint penetration. So to prove the quality, all joints should do the ultrasonic test inspections. All CJP joints. And so we're spending a lot of cost to prove the performance. And this is done in the shop. And I thought that this is the reason why the system in Japan is, will not have a chance to be popular in the world. Because we are using a lot of buildings. And I thought with a lot of research in the overseas, welding is always costly. So they always try to reduce the amount of the weldings. So the idea is completely different. Anyway, after building such kind of tree, we put it in the, uh, the transport in the truck, and we put it, we deliver it to the construction site. So maybe you, when you have a chance to visit Japan, and if you have a chance to visit close to the construction site of steel structures, this is a typical construction uh, procedure. So first we will build, we will put, install the columns, and then we install the beams to connect with the tree structures. And we usually use a high strength bolt to connect the beam to the column side. So this is a typical thing. Probably even if some part, if you see the steel structures in Indonesia, it usually use H profile for the for the columns in the beam. So this is a significant difference. I don't know why the box column came so popular in Japan, but one of the reasons is the property in Japan is really limited. But we would like to have um, a sufficient number of existing force system in the structure. For example, they, they only have one bay in this direction, and they have three bays in this direction. So it means all photo frames must be have a rigid joint, not pin joint. So basically, if the structure in Japan is made like a space frame, so it means they must have a same stiffness in both directions. And we try when you try to have the same stiffness in both directions, each profile having a different stiffness, but each box section is having the same stiffness in both directions. So they would like to take this advantage. So that's, I think that's the main reason we shifted to use the box columns and try to improve the quality of the weldings. So totally different. And uh, this is the design procedures, but I would like to quickly go over this part. So the right side of the equation is giving you the strength of the beam joint. And this one is the demand. So based on the capacity of the beam, but also including the hardening and the strength randomness, we have the coefficient. So depending on the steel grade, like S400, there is a large value, 1.4. But if we, have, if we use like a steel, which was developed after Kobe earthquakes, the randomness will be limited. So we can have a little bit small number. So it means if you select like S4, SS400 for the beam, joint should have stronger connections. But if you select SN900B, 1.25. So if you compare it to the conventional steels, you, have, you can have a little bit relaxed demand requirement in the joint. We have this kind of process. As I mentioned, there is a lot of welding signals. Organize the joints, and uh, we have two 
types. One is fully welded, or only the flanges are welded. And uh, this type, when we connect the web to the splice on the columns, this kind of joint is uh, usually done in the field because vertical welding is very difficult to control the quality. So this one is called, we, we define this as like a field welded joint. And if the web is welded at the shop, we call it its shop weldings. Okay, this is a little bit uh, giving a lot of equations, so I would like to skip this part. But I would like to, the information I would like you to provide is, probably you realize that there's a lot of welding using the joints. So that's the important part. So one of the idea that uh, when we try to apply the stru steel structures, in, for example, Indonesia. Probably, we cannot directly uh, transfer this kind of joints. So one of the important things is how to reduce the zone, or probably to make the steel more popular material in the structure system in Indonesia. Probably, we can we can we have to invent some joint details. Probably, that's the best solution. Okay, the another topic is about, this is a main, this is a main topic which recently I'm doing in my research group, is about the column of the, the design of the columns. Columns, always, uh, this kind of vertical component is called columns. But uh, we, the important issue is about stability. It means back, once the buckling will occur, the, collapse, the system will collapse. So we have some design formulas how to prevent this kind of buckling mode. And I would like to skip the detail, but uh, <coughs> yeah, we have this kind of program. And uh, also there is a requirement, as I mentioned, that having a damage in the component is allowed in the phase two. So sometimes we must uh, we must allow the column have to be form the dissipation in the member, so plastic is assumed. So also when the plastic hinge is expected to occur in the column, there is some limitations. And uh, this is the, the talking in details, so I would like to skip this part. But anyway, yeah, we, we have a lot of equations to compute. And the important thing that uh, when we try to design the steel columns is still having a sufficient strength. So maybe it can be designed to be a slender member, but uh, this is giving the moment distribution. Based on the first order analysis, if we have the bending moments at both ends, the distribution of the moment should be linear. But in reality, if we have the vertical actual load, the deformed amount will deliver another moment. This is called second order effect. So if it is not carefully designed, the maximum moment will occur in between the members. So this kind, so when you do the design, the maximum should be the important values. So you have to be carefully designed. And this to evaluate where is the maximum moment in our existing standard we have this kind of coefficient, and if the combination of the lengths of the column and the amount of the actual force fulfill this equation, second order effect is not a significant uh, issue. But if this equation, it means if this equation is not fulfilled, it means this kind of situation will happen in the column. So in this case, members should be carefully designed. So this kind of requirements is also included. So that's the, uh, I just uh, roughly go to the column. So the column is also one of the important issues because due to the high strengths, it gives you a chance to be a slender element. The slender <coughs> element means stability will be a very important issue. So I, I hope that you will understand that what the meaning of the slender, slenderness of the columns. Okay, 
And uh, I would like to give uh, what kind of uh, research topics I'm doing and testing pictures will be added from this. So as I, as I mentioned, column is very important. And uh, this is a moment distribution under the seismic actions. And if we follow the design procedures, we have these several limitations. And if we draw the limitations, we can write in this field. There is a limitation in the maximum axial force. There is a limitation also in the slenderness ratio. And also there is a combination limitation. So this is the design uh, limitation. So if the column, which is expected to have uh, dissipated zones, design, the column should be properly designed to fulfill this record. But once it goes to a different moment distribution, it, the limitation will be like this blue line. And this kind of a requirement was compiled in 1981. 1980, sorry. It's a little bit old, based on the old data. But the uh, most important thing is the existing uh, design formulas are derived from the single curvature and monotonal closing and only white flat. But in reality, the column is always having a double curvature bending. And as I mentioned, in Japan, we use a lot of box sections, not using the H profile, and also cyclic loading is very important. So to tackle these issues uh, in our research group, we invented some testing jig, and this one is giving you the overview of the testing jigs. And uh, I think it's very difficult to understand what's the specimen and what's the jig. So one by one, I would like to explain. This is giving the whole view. And this part is a specimen. Jig is a really large specimen. And this is uh, supported by the linear guide. So we use the uh, actuator to apply the actual force in the specimen. And in the other side, which is the jig is connected to the strong beam, and there is a part. So we apply the force, the moment force, at this end. And uh, under this uh, loading system, the column will be subjected with actual force with a bending. So this one is the best. <coughs> and you can see that uh, when we just take the part of the specimen, actual force is applied to the specimen, and the moment are subjected to the component. So this is giving you the, uh, the test setup. And this one is the best before testing. So eight profile is installed in between the test jig. And during the test, we will see this kind of lateral total deformation. So this is a reality. If you have a slender element, some auto deformation will occur. <coughs> this is a test after the test. So significant deformation will happen. And another thing is, this one is giving you the same length of the specimen. The difference is actual force. This is actual force, 0.2, and you see a large deformation very close to the end. But if you increase 10%, it's shifting to the outside. And this is the same amount, but if we just if we switch shift to the cyclic, monotonic have the large deformation at the middle of the members, but if it goes to the cyclic, Local buckling occurring at the end. So monotonic shows this kind of failure mode, but once it goes to cycling, even if the load level is the same, just difference of the loading loading profiles gave us a significant different collapse mode. So that's why cycling testing is really important. And this one is giving you the pictures, uh, movies. So this one is a load collapse. Collapse mode and uh, local buckling. So if you see, you can see that local buckling. Only the deformation is happening in here. But if you see this specimen, the length is the same, but the amount of the actual force is different. It's starting to deform, but then you can see 
relatively large deformation occurred, and the local buck bait shifted a little bit in the middle. And this one, giving you the same members, if you apply the load and upper side, we never observed a local buck bait in the low end, but a large deformation, which is due to the P delta, second order effect, was observed in the specimen. So when you do the design, you have to be really careful. What is the collapse mode? As mentioned, phase two is allowing you to have a plastification in the members. But if you have this kind of difference, probably this kind of failure mode will trigger to the collapse of the structure. So this should be avoided. Okay, uh, I will a little bit shift this part. This is going to be the same. And this one is giving you the result. First thing is this is the strength. So this is a current requirement, and this vertical line is a very current requirement. And the horizontal line is also the requirement. Uh, this one is giving the deformations. So if you fulfill these this limitations, deformation capacity will can be guaranteed to have this horizontal value three. But from the testings, it showed that the, required, the deformation capacity equal to 3 can be obtained even if we have a relaxed limitations. And also, in the biaxial bendings, the limitation is here, but uh, we can have fulfill this uh, minimum deformation capacity even if it go two times larger than current existing limitations. So, this kind of uh, result can be an advantage for the design, but this kind is not included in the design manual. So if we have any question, the questions, this kind of result, which we're doing with my students, can be additional, additional information for the next upgrading the recommendations. Okay, and finally, I would like to give you the information on the special voltage moment frame resistance system. And this one is uh, uh, the project which, uh, which I'm doing with uh, the US professors. And this concept, this design system is not using a large amount of voltages. So I say this was a dry system. This is a connections, so this is a columns. In this uh, preliminary project, the plate was welded to the columns, but we are just using the field load, not the full penetration. And the beams are connected to this point. So it means less loading and more reliable connections. And uh, this one is a test setup. Columns, beams, and the joints. And you can see that the plot we had a very stable hysteresis curve. Stable means energy can be absorbed as we expected. So we observe this kind of results, but of course we have to carefully imagine what kind of failure mode will happen. So in this specimen, this one using the build-up beam, but the, in the ultimate in state, we observe this kind of lateral motion of concrete. But this occurred like in 6% sort. So it's going beyond the limit of the, the allowable stress, the allowable storage. So we are still moving on this, but uh, <coughs> we are trying to invent this kind of new joints. And the last project is uh, relating to the light gauge, mainly the okay, industry uh, producing this kind of members. So the members less than 2.3 millimeters are used for the structural component. So the advantage is coal forming can be easily handled. So if you're just having a simple opening, you can intuitively imagine that strength reduction will be relatively easy to occur because this is a free edge with a very thin material. But cold forming, if you add some stiffened element due to the cold forming, we call it burning opening, this kind of stiffening will give you an advantage to have a less strength reduction. And this one is an after picture of the deformed shape. So if you don't have just have a simple opening, sure buckling can occur easily. But if you have a stiffened burning opening, 
you can take this advantage and prevent the occurrence of shear pump. And also, we tested some different aspects, having a continuous holes and check how the deformation will occur. And this kind of testing was finally applied to the real practice, and this is called the shear wall systems using the real practice. So this one is a burning hole to resist the shear force, but the burning, which is a stiffened element, will help you to prevent the early stage buckling in the plate. So this flat component will be in place to happen the shear buckling, and the holes with the ribs will be helping not to occur the shear buckling in whole plates. So this one is one of the practice that the, the preliminary study was reached to the final product. And uh, now I'm working with the cockpit industry to use this kind of light gauge material, which can be more properly used in the scientist practice. And we are now, probably next year, we are going to do some testings. Yes. Okay, so this one is a topic about what I am conducting in my research group. And I would like to give a brief information of the typical lifestyle in our research life. Research satellite. So this one is giving you about the picture of our research group, and probably there is a lot of professors who have an uh, experience to work in the group of the uh, Japan. So basically, professors and students are staying in the same floor or in the same room. And I just took the picture from my office to the student space, and basically, uh, the end of the bachelor course, they will join to the research group, for example, in my lab and they will do some research which is related to the upgrade of the site procedure, the recommendations or the requirements of regulations. And uh, master students, doctor students, bachelor students are living in the same room, so they always have a communication. Sometimes they are really discussing a serious issues, but sometimes they are having a more relaxed mind and enjoying the life of the rooms. Yes. So this one is a little bit messy, but don't don't uh, don't look at this one. They're really enjoying. And sometimes they're doing some discussion. Probably they're not discussing about the topic of the research. They're just fighting to who will eat the cake. <laughs> okay, but we are having relatively relaxed uh, atmosphere in the labs. Okay. And uh, I think I would like to finish. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? So uh, I will give you uh, maybe three questions uh, before the last uh, question. But I just want to give some uh, words to give you the gift from uh, okay, uh, there is a three questions. One, two, and there is a one from two. Yes. Okay, two, two questions. Please. Come over. Or you can you can speak some. <laughs> so, so my question is to the patients. Uh, first, you explain that uh, there is many effects uh, is after the, the first effect is caused by blood cooling and by fire. And after the regulations and the, and the regulation and and the system is upgraded. There is a reduced in the victims. Uh, and and many differences you uh, you still you still to to prevent uh, to prevent the 
about to be proven there is six limits to the building. And so, uh, which, uh, because N15 is caused by fire, and I know that still is at low resistance to the fire. Yeah. So, how how the Japanese overcome that problem of fire resistance? And so, the second question. Uh, I'm talking about crack about crack resistance of the floor building. So, is there any materials or technology that can be applied to, to the floor to be crack resistance? Uh, uh, this means I, I'm not talking about small cracks, but uh, it's wide cracks, like uh, three meters or more cracks in the ground. So how do you avoid to avoid the building to not be collapsed and to not be swallowed by that crack? Okay, that's my question. I think, I think you can take uh, the questions. Uh, maybe second question. Uh, good morning. Uh, I want to ask the question, is it okay? Okay, so the first about the building irregular, irregularities. Like uh, you said that the regular building, uh, the regular shape, uh, will tend to have a more safe uh, factor than the irregular one. So uh, if the architect want to design an irregular shape, uh, and they place the columns, uh, in like in irregular place uh, for you, is it better to uh, have a very uh, smaller smaller module, or uh, you like to increase the quality of the material? Okay, and then the second, uh, as I know that the concrete will uh, better to handle compression force rather than a tension force. So uh, for you, is it better to have a full steel, constru steel construction or uh, you have concrete material as the column material and steel as the beam material? And relating to the first question about the fire protections, because in the old days, uh, we use the bare steels. So we just install the steels. But uh, from the point of view, from the, from the fire safety, it is requested to have a fire protection covering the bare steels. So it's depending on the locations. But uh, at least, uh, for example, if you have a chance to visit like uh, carpools with uh, multi stories, they cover the surface of the steel with like. Uh, spraying something like close to stone. So they, they get melted like a fiber and spray the surface of the steel and cover it like a four centimeters. And they improve the fire resistance by the test wounds for like uh, one hour. And uh, they have to prove that the strength degradations will, no, the strength can be <clears throat> not having a sudden drop of, of, to keep until one hour. It's one hour giving a chance for the firefighters to stop the fires or giving a chance for them to get back away from the building. So we have this kind of regulations, not only the steel, but also the timber structures. And about the ground, ground cracks in the, the basement of the structures or soil. Um, I, I, I don't have the... Maybe, maybe, no. Probably, I'm not a specialist of the ground. But uh, when we do the design, probably when we construct some buildings, uh, and over, of course we have to build the construct buildings over the ground. So if the soil is not in a good condition, they have to first modify or make some modification in the soils. And if the soil is not sufficient, they have to install some piles, which will can reach to the very stable soils layer. So for example, in the coast area, intuitively, intuitively you can imagine that liquefaction is irregular and easy to happen. So in that site situation, they install a lot of piles under the ground, 
and uh, they were not relying on the soils at the upper layers. So they will build to the foundation over the piles, and the force which is coming, resistance coming, the force coming from the upper structure will directly go to the piles, and the piles will transfer the force onto the stable soils layers. So in such situation, liquefactions will happen in the lower layers, but in the upper structures, it will never have an effect. Of course, the stairs will disappear or something, such kind of minor problem or damage will happen. But once if the liquefactions or the earthquake event will be stopped, they can fix it like uh, in, in original in original forms. So we will do, do like this way. Yes. But for the residential houses, sometimes it's a problem. Because putting a pile always costs a lot. So yes, so always think that residential houses are having a problem. So one of the solutions is they put a really uh, mat slab. It's like a boat. So once it's the liquefaction, so parking happens, some tilting will happen in the houses. But the upper structure is just tilting. So they will put some jack to uplift the houses and put it in the original position. But this is also very costly. So I don't know how the developers are dealing with these problems, but uh, yes, we're having this problem. But basically, in a very important or large building, we put the piles to avoid these issues. The second question is irregularity. Yes, um, one thing is that irregularity is not just coming from the plan view. We always, always based on the calculation. So the important thing is you have to know where is the center of the gravity and center of the uh, stiffness. If the center, it means if it, if, for example, planning. If you have in the in the same point, it, there is no eccentricity because the center of the stiffness means the center of the rotations. Because the center of the mass will have the response acceleration will always subject in the center of the mass. And if the center of the stiffness is located in a different place, this distance will determine the additional portion of it. So even if you have an irregular plan, but if the one of the solutions is if you properly locate the resistance component in the plan, it will give you the answer that eccentricity and the stiffness, the center of the mass and the center of the eccentricity can be very close. In this case, you will never have additional moment or less moment. So this is one of the solutions. And the probably designer will try to solve the eccentricity problem by to carefully discuss with a structure engineer how to locate the component which is used for the level of resistance. But so for the materials, probably if they try to use uh, very high performance materials, I think the advantage is not limited. So they first try to relocate the components to avoid eccentricity. And in the columns, so did I give you the answer to the first question? The second question is about the columns with concrete. Yes, as you mentioned, the concrete is having a sufficient strength in compression and very weak in tension. But uh, <clears throat> I think a uh, full steel structure or full reinforced concrete structure, we always have to have some mix of it. Like uh, steel is having a sufficient strength also in tension, but due to the advantage of the high strength compared to steel, uh, the concrete, 10 times stronger than concrete probably, steel is. But strong columns, the strong strength means slender elements can be used. It's really flexible. Flexible means always service limits they will limit. Make a limitation. So in some cases, 
we have to use very stiff columns in the first order, the highest, for example, the tall building. So in such case, we put the columns in steel, but we say composite members. Cover with concrete or full fill the tube with the concrete to obtain a sufficient strength. So it's always the best mix. <coughs> but uh, of course, there is some project using the columns, reinforced concrete and the beams, the steels. But uh, we have to be careful that uh, when you try to limit the storage, cracking is always happening in the concrete. But uh, yes, in some project, some designers try to use the co concrete columns and beams for the steel. So 100% steel is uh, only used for a low build, low rise building, like three stories, four stories, five stories. Yes, we use tools. In the commercial buildings, we use steel. But for the residential apartment or buildings, we use reinforced concrete. The reason is coming from the service of the units. Because steel is flexible, so vibration can be a problem. In the office building, probably it's not, it's a minor issue. But for the residential houses, for example, if in the night, if somebody walks in the upper floors, if you feel the sounds of the vibration, it's really uncomfortable. So to avoid such kind of issues, constructors would prefer to use a reinforced concrete for the residential houses. This is a way which is very easy. Okay. I hope I give you the answers. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So, uh, give a big applause. <laughs>